Hey folks, Quilly Dean here, and welcome to another episode of our C-Sharp tutorial for complete beginners. Right now, we have a game where we can move a character around, that's our at symbol over here, using the, the arrow keys. We've learned about variables, we've learned about classes, but why is this screen so blinky? Well, the reason it's so blinky is because we introduced this console.clear command in here to blank out the screen before redrawing the units. But there's that split second where the screen gets blank, so there's nothing on there, and then the units get drawn, and as a result, you've got this blank drawn, blank drawn, blank drawn, which is where the blink comes in. But, whoops, if we don't have the clear command, then what we end up with is as we move around, our old character, like where we drew our character before, is still there. We're not clearing the old character off the screen. So that's not good either. So how do we get how do we get this to work the way we would be a little bit happier? So we're going to look at that first, um, and then assuming we've got time, we're going to look at um, the AI and ways for your player to die, and like sort of make a game here. It may not quite fit all into one episode, we may go into the next one, but we'll see what we can do. So first, let's take care of a better way of drawing our character. Now I will say, if, um, if you're going to do a more sort of serious console application, you'll probably want to look into implementing something like a, a false sort of frame buffer kind of thing. Um, and for an example of that, you can look at my latest Ludum Dare entry, which is called, it's called Wake Up Call, and it is a pure console game, and I introduced this sort of frame buffer system to manage the drawing a little bit better. We're not going to do that in this episode, but if you're curious about something that's a little bit more comprehensive, you can go and look at that entry. Hopefully there's going to be a link down below in the description box. If I forget, if you just go to quill18.com, there'll be a link on the front page there to my Ludum Dare entries, and just check, up, check out Wake Up Call. Anyway, so obviously this console.clear is not going to work out for us because we don't want to clear the whole screen. So how are we going to do this instead? Well, what I'm going to propose is that um, when we do the player update, maybe instead of blanking out the whole screen, what if we just blank out the area where our character's in? What if we introduce something, and this is going to sound kind of silly, but it might be sufficient. What if we introduce something called undraw. All right, let's start with this. Let's start with this approach. For all I know, this is going to be perfectly satisfactory, but we'll see how it goes. Let's say first what we do is we undraw the old characters. Undraw the old character spots. Then what we do is we update the units, which may mean they move, and then we draw them again. So let's see what that would look like. So in our unit class, that's where we do our draw. Well, our undraw is going to be the same thing. Public void undraw. What we're going to do is we want to clear its, its location. So we set the cursor to be where this, this unit is. And then instead of writing out the unit graphic, we just write out a blank space. Like that. So this is a character that's just a space character. So it's going to overwrite whatever's there. What happens if we run this? Ah, we still get blinking. Oh, even though we're not doing a full screen draw, What's happening here is we are blanking out the old position still and then drawing a new one. So we're not we're not quite there. Okay, so we know that every frame we can't simply call undraw first. That's no good because if the character's not moving, it looks like we're blinking. We only want to call undraw if the character is going to move. Right? So right now, how do we handle character movement? Well, right now, it's only the player that moves. And what we do is we change X and Y directly. Okay? We change that directly. Well, one thing we could do in our unit class, because X and Y are properties, so their values get set over here, before we set a new X value, we could undraw here. Right? We are moving, so undraw. We could do this, and we could do this before the Y as well. So our undraw routine is fine. We just make sure we don't actually call it right over here. This way, the only time undraw gets called is when we actually move. So what would this look like? Well, now we don't have any blinking, and when we move, our old character gets deleted. That's amazing! Now, is this 100% the solution? Eh, there's still some weirdness here when two characters are on top of each other, because first the at symbol gets written, then the x get written, and then the at symbol gets written. Although, maybe that's correct? I think it's kind of a moot point for our game, because in our game, two characters should never occupy the same spot. 
what is what's going to happen is if they hit each other instead of moving into each other they should just do damage to each other and maybe you know maybe the one the, if one dies then you can move into it and i think that would be a properly a properly probably a fair thing now one thing that is a slight issue if it, for some reason both the x and the y change in the same frame like let's say we move diagonally right in which case we would change x and y we don't we don't have a key bind for that but on our numpad we could do like the nine key on our numpad could move us right and up right as opposed to two separate steps in which case what we would be doing in that situation and i mean we can test that over here right let me put in a little uh a little one over here so numpad nine would be moving up and to the the right. So to the right is x is equal to x plus one, and up is y is equal to y minus one. So now the nine key on the numpad, uh, oops, and then we need a break. The nine key on the numpad will move us diagonally upwards, and that works, and that's great. This technically results in two undraw commands because it will call undraw here and it will call undraw over here. The other thing, as I have noted, is when you have a property like this, a lot of times you want to avoid side effects because it's not intuitive that when we set X to a new value, it's also changing the console display by writing out a blank. That may not be intuitive. Instead, what we might want to do as an approach, we're going to leave this as is, but what we might want to do as an approach is instead of having X and Y setters like this, we may just want to go back to that earlier example that we did a while ago, which was like set position as a function where you pass it in X and Y. And the advantage of that is if both X and Y change, well, it's still, and so have set position call undraw. And that way, if you if both X and Y are changing is just one call. So it's only undrawing once, which sounds a little bit more efficient. And it's much more acceptable, the idea that a function call might have a side effect like clearing a tile on the screen or uh, as opposed to a property. The other thing you could do is instead, in, instead of directly calling undraw here as well, is you could have some sort of property in here, right? Some sort of private um, property called, you know, has, uh, so Boolean called has moved. And instead of calling undraw over here, instead we simply call, we set unmoved to true. Normally it would be false. We'd set has moved equal to true, which then during the drawing step has some sort of other effect or, or something like that. You know, there's a lot of ways of handling this. I think for our purposes, this, this appears to be perfectly fine. And the bonus to this um, solution right now, as opposed to doing, you know, undrawing here in the player unit, this is happening on the unit level. So this is automatically going to make both player and enemies move and, and deal with that properly, which is very, very, very cool. Okay, so we've got that. Um, what I would like to do is tell you what, let's, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add basic AI to our enemy unit over here. It's gonna be very, very, very simple. So these enemies simply move from the right side of the screen to the left if they go out of out of bounds then we um then we sort of delete ourselves then we delete ourselves how does that work we'll get to that later on okay but for our our enemies what we're going to do is this we're going to say so on each update we're simply going to move one tile to the left, one square to the left. How do we move to the left? Well, it's x is equal to x minus 1, right? Move 1 to the left. What is this going to look like if I run this? I'm going to run this and oh, it crashes right away. What? Why is it doing that? Well, it's not actually crashing right away. It's crashing because the x is going out of bounds to the left. And you're going to say, oh, but I thought, I thought if we remove this, and we run this, the X is here. How come it suddenly appears there? And actually, let's change where it spawns. Our game over here spawns an enemy. Uh, let's set it, the enemy to spawn at the far right side of the screen. So what is that? That's console.window width minus one, because remember we count a um, column starting at zero. So console.window width minus one will start the, the X, start the enemy at the furthest right side of the screen. So let's run this. 
And okay, there it is. It's it's there. That's good. Now in the enemy AI, let's get it to move one to the left every time there's an update again. So we're gonna run this, and again it crashes right away. And the X is over here on the left. What's going on? Well, first of all, it's entirely reasonable. As soon as the X tries to go out of bounds, it crashes. So okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna do something like this. Um, um, move one to the left, but only if we can still move to the left. So if x is, say, larger than 0, because 0 is the smallest x is allowed to be. So if x is larger than 0, then we move to the left. Else, we are at our move limit. So do something, question mark. We don't know what that something will do, be yet, but now if we run it, we're no longer going to crash because we'll never go out of bounds. And indeed, that's true. The X, and you're, you're going to have to have some faith here, the X is starting here and then moving one tile to the left on every single update until it hits here. The problem is our updates are way too fast right now. We don't see it happen because this is a very simple program that's probably running at hundreds of frames per second. So that X moves faster than we can actually see. So how do we solve that? Well, there's a f like everything else, there's a few different ways. A very, very, very simple way of solving this is making a decision as to what frame rate the game should run and sticking to it, right? So let's say with something like this, because it's very low resolution, we don't need a very high frame rate because, I mean, every every quote unquote pixel that a character can move on the screen. I mean, we've only got 80 pixels wide and 24 pixels high. So moving one pixel is really significant. So we don't need really high frame rates because there's no real fluidity to our program. We could very simply, we could easily run at an apocalyptically low frame rate, like 30 frames per second because we're a console game. <clears throat> so, all right, let's take this very old approach first where we try to set up a fixed frame rate for a game to run in. Um, it's only going to, it's not going to be the final solution and even um, as a temporary one, it's going to be a partial solution, but we're going to see how it goes. So this is going to be temporary. Okay, temporary temp. Let's try to set a fixed frame rate. This is going to be our first try. And this is a very old school kind of approach, right? So we're going to say, we want, in, we want to say desired FPS. We're going to try to run at 30 frames per second. So this desired FPS is just a placeholder variable for us to hold this. Really, this is the sort of thing that, you know, could go in a lot of different places. Let's just set it here. That's going to be fine. Then we're going to say, what is our correct, say, frame delay in milliseconds? It's like that. that is what we're doing here. And that's going to be, it's a thousand, that's how many milliseconds are in one second. And if we divide this by our desired FPS, then we will get a number here, which is the time that is supposed to be between each frame. Now that's a very cumbersome way of doing it. A much more common way of doing, of writing this would be something like the difference in time between frames, or maybe say the delta time. Now, in particular, this is a delta time in milliseconds. Do we keep the MS here, maybe? You know what? I will for here. That's going to be fine. So what desired FPS is the number of frames that run each second, and the delta time is the number of milliseconds each frame is supposed to take to make that happen. A thousand divided by 30, is it? Is it 33? Oh, God. Do not math on live TV stuff. Come on, calculator. Help me out. All right, good. So, um, oh, my internet went out. Aha. Good stuff. So, um, so we've got this. Again, this is just a very, 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 very temporary little something, but let's move on. So what we want to do is instead of having things uh, run at like 1,000 FPS, which it might be doing now, we want to only have it run at 30 FPS. Again, this is not the correct solution, but it's a first try, and it's very old school, and we're very old school here. So how do we do that? How do we get now we need to wait for the correct time for our frames per second. So how do we do that? Well, there's nothing built into C Sharp for this, but there is something built into the standard C Sharp library, which is to say, same thing as using system over here, we're gonna include using system.threading. And I don't actually have to include this using, okay? 
actually let me let me back out a little here what i could say is threading well system dot threading dot thread dot sleep and then we sleep for a certain number of middle milliseconds which in this case is our delta time ms but because this is kind of awkward to write if i just say using system dot threading then i can just say thread dot sleep this is not a multi-threaded application but it still runs in a thread it is a single threaded application and the thread library lets us interact with our thread and this puts in a sleep now what we could do is you could set up a little infinite loop over here you know until a certain amount of time has passed just keep looping over and over and over and over but that would actually use 100 percent of our cpu with thread.sleep we actually tell the cpu that our current thread don't execute it for the next 33 milliseconds. And then the CPU can do other things, or it can just rest so that it doesn't overheat, for example. So this is the best way to delay a certain amount of time. Although your program is going to be unresponsive in that, but we're only delaying for 33 milliseconds. So if we run this, now all of a sudden you can see the X move across the screen, because it doesn't run infinitely fast. Did you see it? Let's do it one more time. There it goes, right across there. Now, maybe that X is still moving too fast, or maybe it's not moving fast enough. So you're like, uh, I, I, okay, if I need it to move slower, I guess I could lower our fixed frame rate, but that, okay, that, that works, it's moving slower, but what if I want my different enemies to move at different speeds? Or what if I want them to move at a speed that's not necessarily the same as the frame rate, right? Because right now, if I set it to 30 FPS, then it moves one square per frame. But what if I want it to move, I only want it to move a square every other frame, or you know, or a certain amount of milliseconds or some sort of delay like that. Well, that's why we're gonna need a slightly more sophisticated solution. And the bonus of it is we won't have to worry about a fixed frame rate. The other thing is at this point, we assume that this bit here executes almost instantaneously. And then we sleep for our 33 milliseconds. But what if this whole thing over here took, I don't know, 20 milliseconds to execute? Then we, we shouldn't be sleeping for 33, we should only be sleeping for 13. So how do we resolve all that? Well, that's what we're gonna do. And you know what, I'll put a cut here. We'll, we'll keep it nice and organized. In a follow-up video, we're gonna look at how you regulate these frame rates in a much, much better way. Or in fact, don't even regulate the frame rate, and but instead pass the correct amount of time information to our units here so that the AI updates in a way that feels more correct. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this. I know this one's a little shorter. I'll try to get another one out real soon that addresses this next bit. Thank you very much. See you next time. Thank you to all our August patrons, i.e. people who pledged in August and who are supporting videos from September through to early October. And especially these Mike Check supporters, we got Ole Peter Talgo, Adam Conway, Drazion, Jan Tori Vell, Adjective Michael McClintock, Aaron Teufsen, Craig Mortel, Julian Auger Lafon, Marius Field Vold, Speedy Savant, Steven Steger, Valiant Cake Fiend, Wes Oldenboving, Jason Yanity, Kale the Quick, Neil Blakey Milner, and Yukofin, and everyone who's watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed. Thanks for watching. See you next time.